Who is Jesus? When you think about everything you know of Jesus, that he was the Son of God made flesh, the one who cured diseases, who raised people from the dead, who cast out demons, the one who taught so eloquently in the temple as a young boy, and the one who as an adult refuted the elders and the teachers of the law, the one who died, who rose and ascended into heaven, When you consider all of those things when trying to answer the question, who is Jesus, you really only have three options. C.S. Lewis, the atheist turned Christian Christian, apologist and author, he said that when it comes to Jesus, he's either liar, lunatic, or Lord. Now, if someone thinks Jesus is a liar, they don't believe anything that the scriptures say about Jesus to be true. And if someone thinks Jesus is a lunatic, they thought he was some raving madman off his rocker, roaming the streets of first century Jerusalem, cultivating and propagating this new cult. But if you believe everything that scripture says about Jesus, then you believe he's Lord. So who is Jesus? I remember asking that question uh, a lot while canvassing the streets of Sharpsburg, Georgia last year. And the answers I received varied. Some would say he was a good man. Some a prophet, others a teacher. One guy said he was a first century historical uh, person who lived in Jerusalem. I even had one guy tell me that Jesus was a legend propagated by the Christian church and he never even existed. In all but one of those statements, there is truth. Jesus was a good teacher. In fact, he was the best teacher who ever lived. Jesus was a good man, but he was more than that. He was the perfect man. Jesus was a prophet, but he was the prophet who put an end to the need for further prophets. These statements, while they are true, by themselves aren't the whole truth. They miss the big picture. That Jesus came to do something bigger, something more profound, something that unbelieving hearts aren't ready to hear, but it's something that they so desperately need. You know, while on these canvassing outings in Georgia, I remember one specific conversation with a man not much older than myself. I asked him, who is Jesus? And his response made me pause. Jesus is whoever you want him to be for whatever circumstance you're facing in life. Listen to that carefully one more time. Jesus is whoever you want him to be in whatever circumstance you're facing in this life. The reason that that statement gave me pause, the reason that that line of thought made me stop and think is because it's dangerous. It is a slippery slope, but that is the thinking of 21st century American Christianity. That it doesn't really matter what you believe about Jesus. You could believe one thing and you could believe one thing, but you can worship together in harmony and love and peace. You can coexist because it doesn't really matter, does it? That is a real and true danger for Christians today. To mistake who Jesus really is. When things are going hard in your life, It's not often that you mistake who Jesus is. When you are dealt a hand from God that you don't think you can handle on your own, you know just where to turn. You run to your Savior's side and you cling to him tightly and wrestle with him in prayer just like Jacob did. But what about when things are going well? When your job is going swimmingly, when your relationships are blossoming, when your kids are excelling, when you even think that you're winning that battle with that sinful old man who still lives in your heart, what about then? 
Well, that's when that line of thinking really comes into play. When things are going well for you, it's really easy to push Jesus aside. It's really easy to think of him as a pie-in-the-sky God who's only there when it's convenient for you to have him in your life. When things are going well, it's easy to think that Jesus' love and forgiveness for you aren't really that needed and you start to lose focus on him. And he becomes a casual acquaintance of years gone by. When those thoughts start to well up in your heart, when they start to bubble over, we really need to check ourselves. Because we're playing right into the devil's hand. You see, he wants us to turn away from Jesus. He wants us to turn who we think Jesus is and who he truly is on his head and mistake his true identity. And that's really what we see in Matthew's Gospel today. A group of men who misunderstood and mistook Jesus' one true identity. On Good Friday, when after his trial, Jesus was led out to Golgotha, the place of the skull, and he was hung on a cross and was humiliated. As people walked by and saw him hanging there, they began to hurl insults at him. You who would destroy the temple in three days and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down. I know you can. This group of people thought of Jesus as nothing more than a liar and a lunatic. I wish I could say that that group was the only one to show up and humiliate Jesus that day, but sadly, they weren't. There was another group, the Sanhedrin. These were the religious elites in Jerusalem. They were in charge of the temple and of worship and sacrifice, and they were the experts in the law. But more often than not, these men were more concerned with political moves and power plays to further their social standing and their, and their careers more than they were concerned with nurturing the souls entrusted to their care. For the whole of Jesus' ministry, these men actively opposed Jesus, trying to squash him like a bug. Jesus was opposed to their law-oriented, works-righteous way to salvation. They thought that Jesus came to usurp the power from the religious leaders, so they actively waged war against him for three years. And now as Jesus was hanging on that cross, their victory seemed imminent. These men walked up to Jesus, hanging on that cross with unmatched swagger and hubris. And they lifted their eyes to the object of their pride. A broken, downtrodden man pierced to wood. These were the men to whom Jesus was brought after he was arrested in the garden. These were the men who stood there and hailed insults at Jesus. They were the ones who stood with bated breath as Pilate pronounced the crucifixion sentence over Jesus' head. To them, Jesus was nothing more than a criminal, and his death meant their victory. And so they began to mock. And this mocking was not short-lived. It was a constant barrage of ridicule and insult. And with every insult, they were trying to drive those nails just a little bit deeper and make humiliation stabs hurt just a little bit more. This man who hung before them claimed to be able to save others. He claimed to have power over nature and physical disease and even over death, that one thing that no man can control. And now he hung there, helpless and hopeless. So they shouted, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Their hubris again drove them to insult. He is the king of Israel. They didn't mean it, of course. This Jesus didn't look anything like a king. In fact, they thought that they were dressed 
and acted more like kings than this man hanging on the cross. A real king isn't dressed in shame and sackcloth. A true king doesn't wear thorns for a crown, but a diadem of precious jewels. A real king has a palace paved with gold, not a hill of wooden sticks upon which he hangs. They thought they knew what a true king looked like, but Jesus, he wasn't it. And now to this man who claimed he could save others, who thought that he was a king, they shouted, Come down now from the cross, save yourself. And then, Jesus, then we'll believe you. That last phrase is perhaps the most, the worst insult that they hurled at Jesus. The Sanhedrin heard first-hand accounts of perhaps Jesus' greatest earthly miracle, the raising of his dear friend Lazarus, who was rotting in the tomb for four days, the raising of him back to life. Do you know what their reaction was when they heard about this? It wasn't to believe. No, they set out to plot to kill Jesus and Lazarus. The stony hearts of these men were so filled with anger and hatred for Jesus that even if he would have come down, even if he would have offered them a sign, it's doubtful that they would have believed. The Sanhedrin thought that Jesus was nothing more than a lunatic and a liar. He wasn't who he claimed to be, they thought. He sure didn't look like a king, and he surely can't save himself. To them, he was a fool who was about to die a fool's death. But these men were so caught up in their spiritual blindness that they didn't realize what their insults were actually doing. Those insults were proclaiming the truth. Jesus was not and will never be a liar and a lunatic. No, Jesus is Lord. He did save people. He opened the eyes of the blind and and the ears of the deaf. He freed mute tongues. He cast out demons. He healed diseases. He walked up to a funeral procession and raised the widow's dead son And he, with three simple words, he called out to his friend Lazarus and he walked out of the tomb alive. Jesus did save others. And Jesus is a king. But not the sort of king that they supposed. Now these men thought that Jesus was supposed to be some sort of earthly king, but that's never what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to establish an earthly realm and reign and kingdom or to live in a palace of gold that would be destroyed when the next world power came. No, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, but it is of the next. It is heaven. It is eternal. It is paradise. And Jesus is the one true king. And it is his kingdom that Jesus, your king, has opened for you. But do you understand why it's open? Do you know why there is a place in in heaven waiting for you? It's because he stayed there on that cross. The Sanhedrin thought that Jesus was a liar. They didn't think he actually had the power to save himself, so they said... Come down off that cross. Save yourself now. They thought it was impossible. But the reality is, Jesus could have come down that day. As he hung there on that cross, he was no less God than he was at any point during his earthly life. As he hung there on that cross, He had the full power of God. And he could have come down. He could have saved himself. He could have shut up the mockers and ended the humiliation, stopped the pain, and prevented his impending death. But he didn't. Why? 
love. Love for you. That was God's plan all along. To send a Savior to fix the brokenness sin caused in this world. To send a Savior to restore the relationship between the holy, perfect God and sinful mankind to make them at one again. But this was going to come at a great cost. To fix your brokenness and your sin, it would take the shedding of innocent blood. And that's what Jesus came to do. To shed his blood for every one of your sins, big and small, past, present, and future, even for the times when you mistake Jesus' true identity, when you try to turn him into something he's not, his blood washes those sins clean. Jesus came to give his life over to death so that you would have eternal life. It was your sin that put Jesus on that cross. But it was his unending, never failing love for you that kept him hanging there. On that hill, hanging on that splintered piece of wood, Jesus earned a forgiveness for you that knows no limits. He freed you from the tyranny of Satan, from the slavery of sin and death's awful sting. His guiltless death satisfied the wrath of God and opened the kingdom of heaven for you. Those men who stood before Jesus' cross were mistaken about who Jesus truly was. But you never have to be. By faith, you know who Jesus is. And while your life may change, while it may get hard, while circumstances may change, Jesus Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever for you. But even if you feel questions of doubt and worry about who Jesus is, wondering if he truly is the Son of God, look to the cross. Because there you will find the simple gospel answer to all of your worries and doubts. Who is Jesus? He's your Savior. Amen. Please stand.